Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on header and front setup for harvesting pulses. My name's Claire and I work with BCG and coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to bring you and increase your knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. Now today we're bringing you an interactive panel. I'd like to introduce you all to our panellists. Rob Launder, who works at PB Seeds at Kauke, been involved in lentil breeding and now has been involved in harvesting pulses on the farm at PB Seeds. Mick Pohl from Walpiup in the Northern Mallee has been growing pulses for the last 20 years and in particular has experience in harvesting lentils for the past four years. Ash Teasdale from Rapanyip in the Wimmera has been harvesting pulses for approximately the last 13 years. Now the purpose of today's webinar is to give you an overview on various front options and tips and tactics for header setup for harvesting pulses as we approach the webinar, as we approach the harvest season. Um, now today everyone will be muted. We will take questions during the presentation. So you'll see a Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. That allows you to type questions in there. You can click that, open the window, type your questions in the box and hit send. You can also send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. So feel free at any time to type a question into any of our panellists. Try and make this as interactive as possible. The webinar is also being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, you can watch it at a later date. Um, now let's get straight into today's presentation. Okay, so Rob Launder has a Gleaner header with a Dyna Flex front with an air reel. Mick Pohl at Walpiup has a JD S680 with a Honeybee Flex front, its first year in 2020, has previously used a John Deere Flex and also a Midwest Rigid front. Ash has a Case IH with a Macdon Rigid Draper front and also uses a Seed Terminator with horizontal mills in the header. So Rob, I'm going to hand over to you for the first question. What's been your experience using a front uh, with an air reel? So the, the main time um, air reels come into play for us is when uh, we've got a lot more um, wet, when we've got lower crops. So last year, so we run two headers, both uh, their paired partners, um, both with Dynaflex, but one's got the aerial, one hasn't. And the aerial comes to its own when we've got a lot lower crops. It just stops it getting uh, stuck on the knife. Um, we had the two headers in the one paddock last year and it was chalk and cheese. You could see where the one without the air front had been. So it's, it's more, more of a benefit when we've got um, shorter crops like we had last season. And the other one we find it beneficial for is when we're harvesting our Kabuli chickpeas, um, especially when they start to get overwrought, we can get a lot of shattering at the front. So that just helps move it in a little bit better. But that's that's the main reason, the main uh, benefits we find with, with the aerial. Um, but in, in, um, in favourable seasons, uh, we don't get, we don't have the losses at the front without an aerial. Yeah. So that's the main benefits with, with air for us. Okay, very good. Um, now Mick, in the Northern Mallee there, you're using a flex front. How do you find that um, in the dune swale system that you're in? Yeah, look, they, they definitely follow the ground a lot better than a rigid front, so that's, that's a given. Um, so much so that it can be too much on some of our lighter soils, so uh, what's left behind can be quite vulnerable on some of the sandier soils. Lentils don't like growing on sandier soils anyway, so it, it just comes down to a package, I suppose. If you've got nice uh, standing stubble from the previous year, um, you can go back to as far as what variety you want to grow leading into a lentil. So Spartacus barley in a normal average 
mallee conditions really too low because ideally for us we'd like that 10 to 12 inches of nice sand, standing stubble um, which then leads into intero sowing so that stubble is not touched and it can maintain its its strength and its and its durability through that whole season. So when it comes to that time harvest now, soon, uh, we've still got that stubble residue allowing the lentils just to keep them up off the ground. So a flex front or a good rigid front uh, can actually stay underneath them without having to use lifters, I suppose. Um, one heavy rain or anything like that with no, no residue underneath. Uh, it does become quite difficult. And I'd, you know, I'd back Rob up, we've never used an air reel, but I can see why you would want an air reel, especially in, in our conditions, which are mainly a lower, lower end of rental growing. Um, flex fronts are, are great on following the ground, but because of their ability not to be able to put the reel, the fingers closer, because of their ability to flex up and take the fingers off. You just can't keep the reel <laughs> low enough, so um, you'll cut all your fingers off. So <laughs> flex fronts are great, but they're not, not the world beaters when it comes to trying to move the product off the knife. So I'll back him up there pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Would you ever go back, back to not having a flex front now that you've had one? Would you ever not have one? Um, I mean, when we talk about the rigid, my experience with the Midwest 15 metre front, uh, I think anyone that drives headers and puts it close to the ground, they're not an ideal machine to be running on the deck. Uh, they are operator, and it's an operator's nightmare. Uh, probably MacDonna of, or that style of rigid fronts are far less forgiving and they've got the ability to bounce, whereas a Mac, uh, Midwest front quite heavy and there is no forgiving. So you do a lot of bulldozing. Um, so it's, it's not ideal for lentils. Some are like Hallmark this year, they've got a magnificent ability to be standing up quite high. Go back to that intero sowing with tall, tall straw. Those bottom pods start developing a lot higher as well. So um, with our agronomist, He's been around for four years, so lentils have been growing for four years. Uh, we've learned a considerable amount in a very short period of time. And we're our first year, all the failures, we've adopted a pro tracker, we've adopted intro sowing. Your pre-emergent damage on our stands are far less, it's still there, but you know, it's a whole package of to get the head of front under the lentils. So it's it's not just a head of front. So would I go back to a rigid? Uh, I'd love to, but I don't think we will, just purely yep. for operator um, management. And our stubble residue levels are now up there. So our erosion issues in our first year of growing lentils was, was high up there. And we've been lucky enough, or deep ripping as well, has helped our productivity on our sand going forward as well. So our residue levels on our sand are on the increase. And that's, that's extremely important, growing lentils before and after. Yep. Very good. Thanks, Mick. Um, now, Ash, back towards the Wimmera region. How do you find harvesting pulses with your rigid front? And which ones in particular are you doing? Um, yeah, I guess, just take a step back. The reason that we went with a rigid front we um, had with our older header, we had um, the old 1020 um, tin front, flex front, um, case front that is. Um, and so harvested all of our legumes with that style of flex front. And then when we moved to a Macdon draper front, um, the I guess the mechanism, the way that they flex is a little bit different and we perhaps didn't see the benefit. We're pretty fortunate where we are, it's very, very flat. So we don't really have to follow a lot of those natural undulations we're only 30 foot front so we felt that the narrower you are i guess there's less you know elevation change across the width of the front so we decided to go just rigid front and see how that went and yeah so far it's been really good the only issues that we have is um if there's an old fence line or a channel that we've filled in that there's a little bit of a rise you know sharply we tend to you know miss a little bit you know maybe 
maybe only a meter or so of crop that you're just cutting the top off rather than collecting the whole thing. But on the whole, it's um, yeah, not really been an issue for us because we are so flat. And um, yeah, like, like Mick said, the, the biggest thing for us is sowing into standing stubble and keeping those pods up off the ground. Um, so you don't have to um, shave the ground to collect everything. There's, and, and, you know, in, in a decent sort of year, um, that's a lot easier than in a poorer year where the lentils don't grow up above the stubble in the first place and you still have to chase them on the ground. But um, so, yeah, we harvest lentils and chickpeas and um, occasionally favour beans with our rigid front on the ground. Um, yeah, like Mick said, the Macdons can be pretty forgiving on the ground with their ability to sort of float, I guess, and, and not bulldoze. If you have it set up correctly, it'll just, yeah, glide along the ground and, and being rigid, we can get the reel pretty close. So we, yeah, fortunately haven't had to use an air reel with this front. We did have one with our old front that we'd use occasionally, but it was always a nightmare season when you had to put it on. So it's, it's good to just rely on the, on the reel. And, and um, yeah, certainly the more crop you have going through, the easier it all is. Thanks, Ash. Um, now, Rob, if you were um, a new grower getting into harvesting pulses for the first time, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to someone who's perhaps new into the, the pulse game? Oh, well, probably harvest starts at sowing. So it's how you collect the paddocks, one part of it. I can't, well, there's probably several points, Claire, I guess, um, coming up to, um, to now, like your, your grub spraying, insect control is pretty important to make sure you've got them controlled because any uh, slight damage to your, to your pulses is going to make harvesting harder in getting your quality once you've got it into the header with splitting and chipping. Um, so that's, and, and header hygiene is, um, because lentils, when you deliver at a site, you get you're pretty quickly docked if you've got too many contaminations. And uh, a lot of the time you're coming out of barley and into lentils. And um, yeah, if you haven't cleaned your harvesting equipment out, it doesn't take a long, a lot of uh, barley or cereal to be left in there to uh, put a trace through your pulses, especially your lentils, because it's around the same time. And they're probably a couple of the key things. Um, there's many points I could probably talk about it if you wanted to, but that's that's probably the two main ones, I suppose. Depends how long we've got. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, now, there's 20 odd um, people on the webinar there, so feel free to type any other questions. We've got three experts here on the panel, so go for it anytime. Um, all right, we've actually just got one jumped in. So with the reels, have you tried anything on them to help get the crop across the knife and onto the platform? And what was your experience? Um, we haven't, but I've, because in the past of other, back in the early days when levels were first getting harvested, helped other growers and we used to suggest like, um, rubber flaps on the on the reel and there was the old Donald reel which was a small little cross um, it wasn't an auger but it was a, it was a I guess a uh, reel that sat close to the uh, the front of the knife and little flaps on it but that would only work on a on a rigid front which is no problems um, but yeah they're, they're the things I've suggested to growers and other growers have come up with that idea of putting um, like flaps on the on the fingers and that has helped sometimes, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we had, uh, with lupins last year, I think we tied some pieces of shuttle across with zip ties, the classic old uh, whatever mm -hmm. works. Um, you know, it's, it's great when the crop is low, it really helps and all of a sudden with variability in soil type, you hit a really good patch of crop and you're sort of knocking more off, trying to feed it into the front. So, um, yes, it certainly does work because you can get quite close to the fingers because you can set them as paddles and they scrape across your fingers. And so you can, it, there is ways to do it. It's trial and error um, and it doesn't cost you much. It's a 10 minutes of an angle grinder and an empty shuttle and some zip ties. So. Um, I think probably one thing about any, all of it is if something's not right, you do have to get out and try and do something about it, especially in our environment where it can be quite fickle. Um, 
probably fingers as well, the open cut fingers, making sure they're not no choke. No, I do know of people that have just gone straight into it and it's just hasn't fed through the fingers. That's just because they were the, the double cut style. Um, there's other no choke varieties that still get that double cut action, but you've got the, the openness of the fingers. So yeah, that would be my input into that. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that, Mick. Did you have something yeah. you wanted to add into that one? There on the no, thing. no, I was just going to say, we, we haven't tried anything with the reel. We've just been, um, yeah, standard the whole time. Um, but yeah, have seen um, a few modifications around, but yeah, we haven't, haven't really bothered with any of it yet. I guess, yeah, if the conditions aren't right, sometimes they're just not right or it's just going to be, you know, a pain anyway. But um, yeah. Do, do you either, or do any of you stop and sort of get out and have a bit of a look and see what, is there any losses? Yeah, you sort of, you sort of have to a lot of the time, especially if it's not going well, if it's, you know, hopefully this year's looking good, it'll be one of those years you can just pull in and away you go. But it's especially those difficult years like 2018 when uh, everything was very close to the ground. There's a lot of, yeah, getting out and scratching and trying to figure out where the, the loss is coming from if it was already on the ground beforehand. And yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of getting out and looking. Yep. That's an important step there, Ash. Yes. Um, I've just had another question come into the chat box. So what, Rob, what fan speed comes out of the reel? Craigie to answer that one, ask me that one. Um, no, I couldn't tell you the exact fan speed because it's a, it's a variable speed. So it actually depends on how heavy the, the crop is and what we're and what the seed we're trying to move like because sometimes you can actually turn it up too high and you can be blowing it up the back of the header and across over the, the out the other off the top of the uh, front actually so it's a bit of trial and error depending on the conditions what sort of material is what weeds you've got in there how heavy the crop is compared to the um admixture so yeah couldn't answer that one I guess in following on from that, in the medium to higher rainfall zones, what would be the advantages to having an air reel? Is, that, is it thick enough that it's feeding in anyway, or would you still need one? Uh, well, it's, it's only when we've got problem conditions. So when we've got, like what Ash was talking in 18, when you're, you're close to the ground, but also some of it we're harvesting different varieties um, and some of them aren't as standing as well as direct to some of the newer varieties. So we find that more, more beneficial, but it comes back into, um, um, yeah, crop condition. So I would say most people harvesting, um, you don't require an aerial. It was only when we're um, having tough conditions and harvesting different crops of different stature. So it's not necessary, no. Okay. Um, how are you measuring your your losses and what is an acceptable loss in pulses? Uh, nothing's acceptable, most fellas will tell you. <laughs> so how do we measure it? Well, I guess we stop the machine. Well, first of all, we try and determine where the loss is coming from. So stop the machine and we work out, well, what loss is already on the ground, um, depending on what the variety is, where timing of getting in there. So determine what already is there and then um, then look at the um, various areas of the machine to see if we're losing it at the front. Uh, so with our uh, Dynaflex, we can actually lose it even when it gets into the, into the front. There's a bit of a gap where the belts, um, so your cross auger to your, auger, uh, sorry, your, your cross belts to where your belts can go up to the front. Sometimes we can get uh, losses there. Um, I would say it is quite like you've got to get used to getting getting losses with pulses. You will never get them all in. It's just a matter of trial and error. I couldn't give you an exact uh, number on the ground to be honest. It's a it's a very hard one. Um, you sow at 50 kg. I, I guess the way I sort of look at it, the same thing with canola. You sow it with, like with lentils, 40 to 50 kg. Some areas lower. Um, does it look like you've got to set the crop on the ground? I suppose you know, and how thick 50 kgs look. So um, it, it's quite common would easily be getting 50 kgs behind 
and that we just can't get up no worries at all so it's there yeah, so i can't answer that one clearly but it's just to get a feel um if you reckon you've got a seating rate on the ground that's 50 kgs yeah did um, Mick or Ash want to add anything to that one? Don't look some days. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it can be horrendous. Um, I think this year is not going to be particularly nice for us. That, uh, that Sunday, 37 degree hot northerly, that's, that has uh, stopped the pod actually developing and the seeds still growing. And so we've got pod splitting uh, already and we're still having this, you know, we're still a few weeks away from harvesting those and we've already got seeds on the ground so the process of seed loss has, has already begun before we've even thought about putting a header in which will be three weeks away at, at the closest so um, yep. what you definitely I can tell you what happens yes they, if they do pop out of their shells they get augured with our front they get augured out to the extremities of the of the um, belts and then you'll see Every so often, these buckets of lentils that get transpired out the end. Same with canola with direct heading. So, uh, head of head of front manufacturers can handle that. Um, it's just the timing. Is if, if they're right, you just got to be in the paddock the day that they're ready. That's all you can do as an operator, and hopefully your front setup is is as good as can be. So, um, acceptable losses. Yeah, as you say, it's just. It's just timing this, do what you can do and yeah, accept it. Mm. You're gonna lose some. Sounds like timeliness is a very key thing there. Um, especially, next especially with paraquat and yeah, especially with paraquat and other products are used to, yeah, it really does need to be there very quickly. Um, the next question is for you, Mick. Um, lupins are really difficult to get into the header. Do you grow them and what do you suggest? Well, this is going to be quite comical. Yes, we do grow them and we've turned them into brown manure because we can't get them in the header front. So there's something for all you pulse breeders and growers that um, we've, had a, say we've had a gut full trying to make make of money out of growing pulses this year looks like there's some magnificent lupin crops out there this year um, but ours are all sizzled up and browned off for brown manure so um, mm -hmm. I've been a very difficult few years for lupins um, but it looks like those that have hung in the game um, yeah hopefully a percentage game the higher the yield the higher percentage you can get in the front so no I haven't what was the question does that answer it <laughs> um. Yeah, that answers it, is it's very difficult to get them in the front. So, yeah, I don't have any tips there. I don't think Rob or Ash grow in lupins. So, oh. they're both shaking their heads. So, mm. thanks for that, Mick. Um, Ash, do you or have you tried lifters with your chickpeas? And what is your experience? No, we haven't used them with chickpeas. We have used them occasionally with lentils. Um, it's always a bit of a, you know, last minute thing. You know, you get into the paddock and it's not working. So you try and put lifters on. They're always a bit difficult. You end up with a bit more dirt than what you'd like. But no, with chickpeas, we haven't, um, I guess, chickpeas tend to pod a bit higher off the ground, I guess. So it's usually a bit easier to get underneath them and and if you're having losses a lot of the time like rob was saying before it's because of shatter um you know as you're actually trying to cut them the chickpeas go everywhere so we haven't had chickpeas lay down on the ground or anything like that um maybe partly we we've been um sowing all of our chickpeas um on wide rows like 30 inch rows our normal rows are 15 inch so we we um shut off every take off every second time to grow our chickpeas which um we've found has no yield um, yield penalty, but helps harvest harvestability a lot, um, especially with, with that shatter because the chickpeas are bunched up tighter in the row. I guess you rely on your reel less to actually push them in the front. They've got, they've got more sort of back pressure on them as you're coming up to, to cut and they tend to feed in a lot easier rather than, 
you know, chickpeas can be quite spread out and thin if they're, you know, if you were to, to have them evenly across the paddock. So we found that having them all crammed into these 30 inch rows, they tend to feed a lot easier. And a couple of years we had side by side trials in the same paddock of 15 inch and 30 inch rows, and we got a lot less shattering um, and could harvest, you know, one or two kilometers an hour faster in our wide rows just because they, they push each other in. So yeah, I guess, um, yeah, we haven't used lifters um, for the most part because the chickpeas are a little bit, a little bit higher off the ground. Yep. Thanks Ash. Um, uh, Rob, what do you recommend with uses of group G products like Sharpen and glyphosate on some pulses? Um, so with, with Sharpen, we will not use it on our seed crops <laughs> for obvious reasons that it can actually affect the, uh, the germination. But um, I don't actually mind the, the use of Sharpen and a glyphosate as a desiccant. Um, the only thing is it's not as quick as your, your paraquat, but I've, the paddocks we choose to use it in is perhaps if we've had some more weed problems and we find that by adding glyphosate with Sharpen instead of paracot with Sharpen, we don't get the regrowth afterwards that you can sometimes just with the paracot Sharpen mix. But the main thing I'll probably there is don't use it on a crop that you're going to use for seed, um, especially if you're going in a, a bit earlier. But you do have to wait longer to, to harvest from, from my experience by using a, a Sharpen glyphosate mixture than you do with a paracot mixture. So it's just to take that longer to turn. Mm. Thanks, Rob. Um, um, just continuing on, I guess, with the, the spraying side of things, what should growers be aware of regarding grazing MRLs on chlorophenolol and other fungicides? Yeah, if you read, um, if you read the chlorophenolol label, huge with halting periods for grazing your, your pulses, uh, pulse doubles treated with it. I think it's 63 days on clean feed after after the use of chlorthenanol. So it's a real trap um, that you've got to be aware of. And that's what we're doing this year. We're planning on which paddocks we're using chlorthenanol on um, and other paddocks we're using different products where we've got a, a uh, lower withholding period or sh a shorter withholding period. So yeah, it's a real, it's one to really be aware of. So that's what we do. We just work out right, right how we're going to potentially want to graze this stubble. Um, if if we do, we'll use a different we will use a different product because we did will have trouble getting into the withholding period. Mm. Yes. Yep. Um, Mick, when I was talking to you earlier, you mentioned about the the importance of planning at harvest time. So. Do you have a pretty good idea at harvest time of what your next year's rotation is and, and how does that imp impact on your harvest height, particularly in your, your cereals? What's your, what do you plan to do at harvest time? Yeah, so next next year's cropping rotation is is pretty well firmly in place. Um, we do discuss it with our, with our agronomist, how we manage all those stubble heights. Um, so yes, there is a plan. There is, it does get discussed and talked about. So yep. hopefully if it all stays up and it allows us to do what we want to do. I think the barley, compass barley this year may be a bit difficult. It's, it's um, a little bit of lodging starting to happen. So hopefully it doesn't lodge too much more. That'll be interesting to try and, they're all lentil paddocks next year. So that's going to be uh, not ideal for for the lentils next season, but you've only got to take what you get this year. So um, yeah, it is, it is all discussed and planned. So um, if it goes back into a, a lentil type, yeah, hopefully we can get that 10 to 12 inches of nice standing stubble. That's what we'll aim to do. Um, for any other, pul any other pulses, um, which we've got canola, not, probably not so much worried about harvest type there, just it's more residue on our sand. And cereal and cereal, it's, yeah, 
maybe a little bit lower, but depending on what the head has performed like, what's, what sort of straw they're intaking in. So, yeah. It's... Very good. Thanks, Mick. Um, to reduce loss with shatter, has anyone used serial extensions to help capture the pods? Yep, in the early days we used to use um, the adapter gap fingers like the little little pink ones. Um, this is when we were using a flex tin front, we used to find that was, was helpful. Um, also on rigid fronts people can, can try them. The other thing guys have tried with little lifters is um, just welding the odd, um, uh, it was like a little iron rod on the, on the um, sort of on the fingers and that would just help lift the, the lentils. But uh, yeah, so we have we have tried that um, years ago, but we haven't used the lifter for a long time because we've been pretty happy with what we can achieve with our flex front. But there's nothing wrong with, with, with trying that. And I agree with like what Ash was saying, um, there's nothing wrong with harvesting pulses with a rigid front if you've got really even ground and and also a uh, the narrow of the front, as he says, it makes it a lot a lot easier. So don't think you need to have a flex front to be successful in harvesting pulses. Yeah. A lot of it's paddock preparation and harvest the year before, as some people would say too. So don't be shy, shied away from growing them because of that reason. Yeah. That's a very good point there. And I can see Ash nodding his head uh, agreeing with that. Um, all right, we've got a couple more questions coming in. This is good. Uh, Rob, what what oh, price, pricing? What price yeah. should growers expect for lentils and chickpeas? Not uh, we were focusing yeah. around header setup on this webinar, but um, yeah, yeah, where the grain marketing's quite the scope. <laughs> well, thinking thinking lentils and chickpeas are perhaps uh, chickpeas have been depressed for quite a while. There's a slight increase in them, but. We, I'm not seeing them back to the glory days of $1,000 a tonne, if that's what people are looking for. We're not seeing that. Uh, Pulsar seems to be, just the chat at the moment, seems to be around that 700, looks to be um, around that 680, 700. Surprised that it seems to be staying at that level, but yeah, I could, I'd, I'd be thinking that's a pretty good price. We haven't had really any other price indicators, and to be honest, I haven't uh, researched it in the last uh, week. Yeah, as to what the other drivers are. There are so many things that drive it, like a cent in our dollar, for example, can can be $12 a tonne on your lentil prices. So the movement in our dollar has a big effect of it as well. So, yeah. So I'm not, yeah, not really qualified to answer that. Yeah, we did have a Pulse Marketing webinar last month. So I'll send the, the link around for that again. That's on the GRDC YouTube channel. Um, any comments on header settings at night and at day, rotor speed, fan and sieve settings? So I guess thinking about when you are changing them, what are you actually thinking about as you change the settings? So we might, if we can get a comment from each of you. Um, we don't probably have a, I guess we don't have a set setting for uh, night or day. Um, general rule is um, as slow as you can without cracking them. Um, and we generally have our concave closed quite up. Um, sieve settings, no, I don't really, couldn't give you a number or size that, that we use there. But the main thing is, is what we're trying to do is basically go as slow as we can, uh, like we're just trying to rub them out. And depending on, uh, I guess how ripe that, it's probably more so how ripe the crop is as well as to what you're doing. But as a general, like we could be down to 340 or something like that. Rotor speed, um, fan speed, just sort of similar to probably your, your wheat, but there's a lot of uh, playing around with it to get it going. Um, the main thing, I guess, you only hold it one thing at a time, I suppose, and see what happens instead of some, some of our drivers will get in there and want to change. Some of our operators will change a couple of things at a time and work can't work out what the, what the change was, but yeah. But sorry, look, 
couldn't say that we have a different one, but the main the main thing is that we're really looking at our sample to see, we, we, know we don't mind if we've got a bit of chaff in there. The main thing is that we're not chipping or splitting the, the pulses, damaging the CK, because you can't clean that out. We can clean the pot out, but you cannot, chip, like if you, you split them, they've got to come out, if you chip them, it's near impossible to, uh, to uh, clean a chipped pulse out of a sample and you'll get downgraded pretty quickly. So the main thing is um, to me, not getting the, the rubbish side of it, having so much admixture in there is not as critical as uh, getting a good whole pulse into your box. Mm -hmm. mm. Hope that answers it enough. Yes, um, Mick or Ash, who wants to go next with some comments on your header settings? Yeah, I actually grabbed my little book out of the header in preparation for a question like this, just so I could sort of have some figures. But yeah, like like Rob said, um, I guess you start off with the rotor as slow as you can go and then gradually speed up until you start chipping or cracking some grains. That's the, yeah, the main thing. The, the biggest, the most damage you can do is splitting, pre-splitting all of your lentils, even though they might end up like that. You know, when somebody buys it, it seems to be the most damage you can do. So yeah, usually, yeah, sort of between three and 400 RPM for the rotor. Um, it'll, it'll depend hugely on the year too. Some years you seem to get really sturdy, um, you know, pulse seeds that you can run the rotor at 450 and, and won't crack a single one. And other years it'll have to be right back at 300. Um, you know, it can depend on if you've had any rain or not. So yeah, that, that really depends on that. The fan can go, can for the most part be pretty quick especially chickpeas it takes a lot to blow a chickpea around so you can usually have the fan going flat out which helps a lot and um yeah i guess sieves are, are usually open quite a way um because yeah i guess there's um the a lot of the chaff or the pods are a lot bigger so you can have it open quite a way to help and they'll still sort of float <laughs> off the back and and um yeah i guess the other one um Generally, our, we use our bigger concaves, especially chickpeas, just to help um, help sort of get them through without spending too much time in the rotor. Um, although usually our lentils, we're just using the same concaves as, as our barley, um, which, yeah, usually work well. As far as day and night settings, yeah, often um, as, as the night time comes along, you will have to just close everything up, or close the concave up, maybe speed the rotor up, um, the pods seem to be really good at absorbing any moisture in the air and they'll get really tough really quickly. And it, sometimes it's just the case of you're not doing a good job. So just knock off. It's better to come back in the morning when the sun comes up and they start to, to dry out again. So yeah, some, some, in some conditions you just have to knock off, but yeah, like, um, like Rob said, it's, it's um, better sometimes to not worry about if you've got a few pods, especially um, some, Paddocks, maybe you've got some weed issues. You might have some vetch or marshmallow or something. They're going to have to go through a cleaner anyway, so you may as well get a few pods and and keep all of your um, you know, lentils in top condition, and you'll fix it through the cleaner anyway. It's not as though you're going to have thousands and thousands of tons to run through a cleaner. They're you know usually yielding a lot lower than cereal, so sometimes the yeah the best option is to just just um, have it in your mind that you're going to have to clean them anyway. Yep. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, it's probably, there's only a couple of points that it's pretty much what Ash and Rob have already said, which I've found in my short experience is that you think they're easy thrashing little, little pods, but when they decide that they don't want to be thrashed out and you think, oh, well, I'll go and do the lentils because they'll be easier thrashing, well, they're not, they're, they can be quite tough little things. Um, which is what Ash said, and I thought that'd be uh, something that we could uh, we'll go and do this because it's really good lentil harvesting conditions. Well, the windows for lentil harvesting conditions are quite a lot smaller than I would have originally thought. So, um, yeah, so I am quite used to seeing a lot of pods in the in the box nowadays, just because of that protecting the seed and and you know just pushing the boundaries of what you're allowed to. So I'm not sure what the actual thresholds is on not how many pods or you're allowed to have, but that's, I think mean, you just got to get used to seeing a few more than you'd rather like. So yeah, that's all I've got to add. 
Sometimes it's a very seasonal thing too. Like I think it was last year I was having a lot of trouble, just the sample full of pods, couldn't do anything about it. Felt as though I should just give up and go work in a supermarket or something like that. And you take the sample into the, into the local place and everyone's got the same issue. It's just a seasonal thing. It's um, yeah. Everyone's struggling to, to thresh them out. They'd, you know, you have the rotor up pretty high and you've still got lentils in the pods and yeah, can't do anything about it. So it can be challenging sometimes, but it's sometimes good to know that everyone's in the same boat. That's reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about um, desiccation prior to harvesting lentils? Yeah, we, well, we desiccate every year. Um, it's been a while since we haven't, although last year there was a couple of paddocks of chickpeas that we didn't desiccate that we should have in the end that had a lot of thistles in. But yeah, for the most part, it's, um, it's um, partly for that, um, you know, consistent, like getting the, the, um, the timing right so you can harvest and, and partly it's to um, sort of control a few green thistles that make life difficult. But yeah, for the most part we do. And the lentils, I guess it's um, just as much of a crop topping you know, operation rather than a desiccating as well, just to try and we tend to be able to clean up a little bit of late ryegrass that's still there. Um, yeah, which is which is a big part of our um, our plan. But um, yeah, we pretty much desiccate um, all of our legumes every year. Yep. We would probably do only twenty percent, so we don't do a lot of crop topping. Um, or, or desiccation, very rarely do we desiccate as such using that, the heavier rate of like a, a, um, a reglone sort of mixture. Um, but yeah, there, certainly in some situations, as I said, if you've got the uh, thistles coming up, cause you a nightmare. So we will, um, yeah, sometimes we'll have to use a heavy desiccant. Sometimes just the light crop tops just enough to, um, to give us a bit of uh, relief in the header getting the uh, Whip thistles just to try and get the uh, I guess the seed head to to explode to get is what we're I guess trying to dry out the seed heads the one that causes the main problem that is the seed head of the thistle I mean yeah but no we don't desiccate every um, every paddock uh, yeah we probably should do more crop topping but yeah it just seems to be we don't uh, need to do it as much as what we yeah as what others do for some reason mm. um, yeah we we. We find, we find it a really important tool for us up on our probably soil types of our lighter, especially we've just had a good rain not that long ago, it's supposed to rain again today. Um, our summer spraying sort of starts then and it's a really good way to, to get rid of the thistles and you know, flea bane starting to pop through. You know, it's, it's a good chance to bring in our uneven soil type to bring the harvest in together and to start our summer spraying campaign off on a good start because once you get through harvest some of those weeds are they're even harder to kill again and the last thing you want to do is continue running a boom spray around while you're at trying to keep headers and trucks you know occupied so we found it a really good way to you know to get on top of things early um, especially if spring is going to throw these late rains at us, which the crops aren't going to use anymore. So it's effectively the start of our next year as well. I was just going to add, and yeah, we, that's one reason we, we're lucky our crops do come in evenly on our, our soil type, so we don't need to do it as as much for that reason. So that's one, that's why we don't do a, a lot of it. So we're pretty fortunate in that way. Yeah. Um, we've had another question, another couple of questions pop in. So anyone using duck feet or blue extension fingers in pulses? Nope. nope. Everyone's saying no there. So that was a very quick, short answer. Um, okay. You've talked about front losses in pulses. What do you do to reduce rotor or sieve loss with pulse harvesting? Yeah, I guess it's um, just a matter of, I guess it's like harvesting anything. It's, if you have, are having 
issues you just have to stop and get out and and try and figure out where the problem is is coming from but yeah it it could just be that um yeah i guess maybe maybe you're trying to get rid of all the all the pods and that's chucking out a lot of good grain too so it may be just a, a, a matter of i guess reducing your expectations or easing your standards a little bit perhaps but yeah it, it is very very tough i guess there's no one answer mm. to sort of overcome those kind of things because yeah if you you yeah getting getting some rotor loss then you try to fix it and it just mucks up everything else backwards of that so yeah it's i guess there's not a lot of help sorry yeah i've probably got much that it's the same i guess processes working through as with any other crop to be honest yeah, as i would say probably a good point is stopping i guess and getting out and having a bit of a look and mm. seeing where you can identify the problem and how to overcome it Now, um, header hygiene is also a fairly big part of your program, Rob, um, at PB Seeds there, sort of with cleaning out properly and things like that. What are some tips you've got for header hygiene? Oh, we've got a big industrial air compressor, which makes our life a little bit easier to uh, blow out, blow out our, our boxes um, and um, all our fronts under the mats when we're swapping between varieties. So we spend a lot of time cleaning down the, the header. Um, but the main thing, I guess, is when we stop swapping from uh, a cereal into a pulse is making sure we've cleaned the box out really well. And um, and what we'll do is we'll drop the um, elevator, I guess the screenings, we just leave the elevators open for the first patch of the crop. To be honest, to make sure we've got no cereal in there because it is a nightmare. We've been um, seen many a grower being caught with uh, tracer barley in their in their pulses and getting really whacked at the, the cleaning stand. But um, they are as the machines are bigger, they're harder and harder to uh, to clean out. And I guess the first thing when we get ahead, we spend a fair bit of time with silicon um, in, in the boxes and the grain tanks and that uh, blocking up the, the gaps or any little traps to make it a lot easier for us. And some people actually will even wash out, wash out the box. Um, but you don't really need to, I guess when we're producing seed, we go to a different level of course as to how we manage that. But as a general rule, blow out the box really well, um, clean under our mats and uh, yeah, just make sure we uh, drop the bit of the grain on the ground for the first hundred metres or so to make sure we've just got no barley. Because generally we've come from barley into pulses. We're swapping between that barley and, and uh, Sorry, barley and lentils at the same time seems to coincide. Mm. But the other thing we do spend a bit of time of with some seasons is blowing out the engine mate. It's nothing to do with hygiene, but that's to do with saving your header <laughs> when we get the dust building up. So we spend a bit of time with our air compressor as well, blowing out the engine bay. But that's a slightly different topic, but it's probably timely to remind them as to uh, blow out the engine bay, especially some seasons. Stops that fine dust and um, spotting that we can get some years. Mm. Yeah, that's a very timely reminder with um, harvest coming up and fire, header fires. Um, we haven't got any more questions coming into the box there, into the Q&A box, but do any of you have any other um, header or front setup tips or or do nots that you'd like to share that we, we haven't touched on yet? Oh, the only thing I probably uh, would, would mention, and so we're not controlled traffic. So, and this year probably won't be a problem for us, but in some years when things are a bit lower to the ground, um, we'll find that we won't follow our uh, wheel tracks. We sometimes we'll go on a slight angle to, to get better harvestability to pick up our pulses better. And in other years, um, we've only harvested one way, so we will, we'll harvest and then uh, um, carry back empty because we were just getting too many losses. We couldn't harvest both directions. So um, some years, if you're getting, you know, if you've got a good yielding crop and you're getting extreme losses one way, can't pick them up, we do do that. 
um, not commonly, but some use it is common to harvest on a, on a slight angle to the, to the way it's sown. Um, there's some of the, the tips, but if you're in control of traffic, of course you can't do that, but with us we're able to, to do that, yeah. Yeah, on, on that point, Rob, we are control traffic and we're yeah. pretty strict on it. So yeah, that's um, one of the big things for us. I know um, there's been a lot of talk, especially the last few years about um, crop competition for reducing weeds and that mm. east-west sowing, you get, get a lot less weeds. We're pretty much entirely northwest sowing because our wind comes from the west and all of our lentils always end up yeah. falling down towards the east. So yeah, we, we sow north south so the lentils can fall across our rows and stay standing up, um, which, yeah, I guess that um, mm. certainly helps. If you have de when we've had decent stubble, I don't think we've harvested um, one way, but yeah, there was certainly a lot of that back um, before we were um, into row sowing successfully, um, mm. which, yeah, comes down to, I guess that's why we went to our wider rows so we can, we can, we can harvest into row so more successfully more often um which makes a huge difference we the first year we sort of into row sowed we still um rolled our lentils and there was just like half a strip at the end of the paddock that we didn't bother rolling and they were the easiest ones to harvest of the whole paddock so we haven't rolled since then <laughs> just because we found that it's easier to yeah to keep everything standing up much easier to harvest agree with that very good um well, oh, there we go. Someone's just said, thank you for the feedback, guys. Great session. Um, well, I haven't got any more questions for you either, and there's no more in the box. So if you don't have any other last minute tips, um, yeah, thank you very much, Rob and Mick and Ash for, for giving up some time this morning to share your knowledge with other growers across the region. Um, if anyone is looking for any further information on pulses, the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. There's also a great fact sheet that's just come out from GRDC around crop topping and desiccation. So I'll endeavour to send that out to everyone as well. And also the Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during the project. So if you have any suggestions or things you'd like to learn about pulses, then please let myself know. Uh, my email is claire at bcg.org.au. Um, once again, thank you very much, Rob and Mick and Ash, for a great session. There's just one thing I wanted to add, let's just follow up what Mick said, because I'm just in your little notes here, is um, get into it before you think they're ready. Um, you know, the timeliness is quite important, and um, quite often when you start in, it looks as though you've got lawn clippings coming out the back, so they can, surprising how, uh, how, um, I guess, green, uh, a slight tinge they can still have, but the general yeah, fit, I'd suggestion I'd say is go and have a look, um, get into them before you think they might be ready, just to, just to see if you can make a job of them, because as Mick said, sometimes the window can be quite narrow, so sometimes you can start a bit earlier than you think, yeah. Thank you. Very good point there, timeliness. Um, now, once everyone leaves the webinar, there'll be a very short uh, couple of questions just to fill out to see how you found today's webinar. This will also enable us to improve future webinars. Um, so if you could take a minute of your time to please fill that out, it would be very much appreciated. Um, this, will be, this webinar will go up on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next week. So thank you very much everyone for listening and thank you, Rob, Mick and Ash. Yeah, see ya. It's clear.